Two children have been giving a chilling account of how a headsman allegedly butchered their 15-year-old brother in front of them at Nshiaito, a small farming village in the Asante Achim North municipality of the Ashanti region. The unidentified cattle heather, according to the children, accosted them at a water source and inflicted machete wounds on the boy, killing him instantly. The villagers searched the area minutes later and arrested three headsmen and handed them over to the Agogo police. The indigents are calling for a government intervention to prevent a resurgence of an age-old conflict between community and its men. Love FM Sirasa Saridonko was in the community and now reports. Enshaeso is a farming community with a long history of headsmen cattle invasion of farms. But Monday's butchering of 15-year-old David Anaria has shocked the entire community. What was supposed to be a daily chore of fetching water with their elderly sibling turned bloody. So this is the water source for both the grazing cattle for the Fulani herdsmen and farmers who farm around this area. Now this is where the crime was allegedly committed. I have here the two children who have come back to the scene uh, to pick their footwear and they are going to tell us what actually happened. No, the grenade was on. Grenade. It's not that happened. I'm not also. No, the grenade also. Then he points to that tree over there. In two years, I was not over there. No, I was not even. I was not even in the second grenade. I was not even in the second grenade. So at the point where he was about to, you know, carry the gallon of water, which is still lying here, he said that the headsman got up from his seat from there again and came back here. This time he drew uh, his machete and came towards him. At this point, his brother was begging him to forgive him if he has done anything wrong. <laughs> At this point, the herdsman was butchering the boy and he says that he was shouting that people should come and rescue him. So he tells me that they ran and at a point in time he told his brother that they should part ways so that they would not be caught. And so he took another ten and the brother took another ten. He went home to tell his people. Their father, Anaria, is distraught. The way I've suffered to raise this boy, he was supposed to write his final exams next year. The law should deal with these Fulani people. The killing is raising fears of the return of herdsmen to the area. In fact, uh, not fear alone, panic. Panic, because you, you see, all people, all, 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 all the people here, we are all farmers. Here. This time we, we, we are gathering our, our crops and they will come destroying them. Destroying them, even if you, you tell Abuchi, don't, don't do all. What, what is this? And, and then if we don't calm down, trouble. So we fear even today to, to, to go to the farm. We don't know whether they have been hiding over there. School has reopened, but who will send his child to come? How do you know if the child will come back safely? We were expecting the police and military to be here today to offer protection and to drive these people away so we can go back to our normal duties. Police have since been visiting communities, urging calm. Inspector Bodhi was seen addressing the community. Please, we urge you to send your grievances to the police. Don't take the law into your own hands. Meanwhile, 
three suspects arrested in connection with a killing are receiving treatment at the Agogo Hospital after a near lynching incident. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko, and Shaeso Asantiachem North, Ashanti region. Erasta Sasari Donko is a correspondent in the Shanti region. He joins me with more on this uh, story. Uh, Erasta, what has police preliminary investigations revealed? Investigations, proper investigations are yet to start uh, because then the suspects who were arrested by the community uh, people themselves and handed over to the police has since been in uh, uh, recovery at the Agogo Presbyterian Hospital. And so uh, doctors say they are going to discharge them. Uh, that was hopefully yesterday. Police are saying that after they are discharged is when they will interrogate them. Uh, it's possible also that there will be a parade uh, for the children who survived to be able to identify uh, which one of them uh, butchered the 15-year-old boy. So proper investigations, I, I was told, um, are about to start as they are discharged uh, from the hospital. How is the community uh, coping with this situation? I would say there is, there is total panic. Uh, the people themselves um, are afraid that what the witness, uh, the invasion of Fulani, a headman, as they call it, um, they think that it will come back. Uh, they fear that the killing that went on, the rapes and other things, will still come back. So uh, those who have, have re has reopened, uh, children are not in full swing in many of the schools we visited because they come from the villages through the farms and the bushes uh, to come to school. And parents are scared with this uh, incident that the children will not return safely. And so people are keeping their children at home. Farmers are not able to go to the farm. That is the uh, nature of the situation there. As you rightly put it, this is not the first time you are hearing this. There seems to be a wound which is triggered any time. And then we are recording some of these things. Uh, what's the background to this, Erastus? So uh, back in 2014, uh, thereabouts, we had um, these uh, nomadic herdsmen invasion in the area, and normally it happens in a dry season where uh, there is not so much food uh, for the cattle to graze. And we are not talking about uh, just one cow or two cow uh, uh, cattle. We are talking about a herd numbering about a thousand when they move and over. And so when they set on your farm, it's possible that they will eat everything on the farm. And so around this time when farmers are harvesting uh, uh, the uh, produce, maize, uh, cassava, uh, you know, all that they can grow on the field, the herdsmen are also bringing the cattle to graze. And in some cases, we are told, they are made to even eat the uh, produce from the farm. And so there is that uh, tussle between the two uh, uh, people, each one, very, very uh, careful. They don't tread on each, each other's toes. As once uh, somebody, a human being, is killed, uh, forgiveness is not easy. Uh, they come with retaliation. And so if the law does not take its course, then it's possible that this side will also want to retaliate or they will want to protect and arm themselves. And that is what brings the conflict. That is what the people are afraid of. Erasmus Asari Donko is a man on the beat for us. We're still monitoring. We'll bring you updates as and when we get them. Now, busy streets, gun blazing, machetes flying, and everyone, young and old, running for their lives. That's how the situation unfolded at Nima in the Yawasu East municipality of the Greater Accra region, where rival gangs engaged in gun battle. It's been nearly 24 hours since then, and many residents are yet to recover from the incident. Some shops are 
along the principal streets are closed. They saw human beings attacked with machetes while one person was shot. The police moved in swiftly to restore calm in what they say could have potentially erupted into a full-blown conflict with casualties as two rival youth groups clashed yesterday. Manuel Quarantine of the security desk visited that community and now reports. <laughs> Those were the scenes on the streets of Nima, a suburb in Ayawasu East Municipality in Accra. Two youth gangs from Mamubi and Nima, who have been in a long-standing feud, clashed on Tuesday afternoon. At least three people sustained gunshot and machete wounds. Well, the reason why they, they always fight is about rivalry. You know, I, mean, I, I think it's about self-acclaimed gang, self-acclaimed boss. This one a rule over this, and this guy also want to rule over this. So anytime they clash, there is a small incident. Then you see the clan, the two clans start to fight. Yeah, I learned it started three days ago. When the other guy came to change money, and the other guy, his rivalry came and asked him, why is he in their territory? And that was the mess. Some people escaped only by the skin of their teeth. The day my shop inside, we had the same things before they started. I don't... Before I realized, I see gun. Pim, then I see inside my thing. You do see? Yeah, I don't get problem with anyone. But I just, I'm in my shop where I hear pim, 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 pim. Before I, realize, I see the gun where I dodge. Where I go home. If I'm here. Came back to here. Okay. Come back to next top. Then you went out. So I can count four different holes um, right through the ceiling and all um, are, you know, perpendicular like that all through the space uh, in the roof there. Yeah. So, number one is this. Two is this. Came back from here. Yeah. Okay, so he's just, uh, now, now showing me. And in fact, there are more holes. For now, almost everyone in the community is living in fear. Many shops are closed and several other vendors are absent. The few vendors who showed up are visibly spooked. The one who is shooting the gun self, I do not see his face, but I did pa pa. Before I come out, I see plenty of people, but I mean, I know if you watch this one, this one, then I run home. I, know, I run and go home. I want my life. It's not the money. I catch up with this coconut seller who won't speak to me. After several minutes of engaging him off record, he shares how he escaped the chaos. For many, it is time for the police to nip the menace of gang clashes in a bad to forestall like, the future the recurrence. The law, sometimes the law no, they work. Sometimes no, they do say the law in the work. Because ask me why. Why, sir? The, the way I, I, I say you should ask me why. Because something is going on inside the area. You see woman be, fellow woman be, where it's not a police or soldier. It's, it's say he is using gun. For what? Because we, this thing where it's happy, we really understand for that thing. Because we, with the area here, we know say our president is the Nima police station. Where if something happens inside the youth, we suppose that boys where they, they do all that thing, they're supposed to catch him. We see say woman be feel killed somebody, they run go, they son come back, they say they leave him. Why? More than 24 hours after the incident, it's many police boots on ground. The goal to hunt down and prosecute the remaining gang members to prevent another clash. Manuel Cranting, Joy News, Accra.
Let's now speak with Richard Kumado. He's a security analyst. He joins us for more on this. I'm grateful for your time, sir. Um, this is daylight gunshot. Um, machete wounds inflicting uh, machete wound infliction on people uh, in one of Ghana's oldest slums. What is your uh, reading of the situation? It must have a blood on it. You can find it three months time. You find that. Actually, a feedback from Dr. Thomas. Hello, Mr. Kumado. I'm getting a feedback from Dr. Thomas, but having heard a question, I think uh, Nima Mamobi and uh, that particular area has been considered as high intensity crime area, and we can only commend the police for their swift action. Considering the nature of this particular violence, and the nature of the arms they are using, a delayed attempt by the police would have been regrettable. So going forward, the police will just need to lay down and ensure that intelligence gathering into the activities of these particular groups are well watched over. That is the only way they can nail them in the back. But what could be accounting for this impunity? Is our security system too loose for people to be walking about uh, during day and be shooting sporadically? Or is it that um, our economic situation is not helping matters? No, no punishable of offenses rationalize bad behavior and it promotes naughtiness. You listen to one of the witnesses you spoke to before you put me on, was saying that people are not being punished enough and the youth are taking the law into their own hands. It to be a test case for the police, particularly the nature of this particular one, to be able to crack the whip. And once we are not investigating conclusively and we are not punishing people for breaching the law, others rationalize that particular behavior and they will want to release mayhem onto other people. It's regrettable, but not in the city of Accra, closer to where the president lives. I think the police must act quickly as they have done. And going forward, they will need to engage the community leaders and ensure that they water down the ground so that this kind of activities will not be happening in our country. I'm happy that you talk about unresolved crimes because we've seen a number of them that have gone on without any closure to those matters. Definitely, this is not the first time we're seeing this. We've seen uh, this kind of impunity across the country. In, in some instances, it's the police themselves who are attacked. I mean, how do you recommend that we go, uh, we, we move from here going forward, especially bringing closure to matters that has to do with perpetrators in similar incidents? I think it's a text on what Dan Parry has done so far. He would just need to send it a little bit higher. The promptness and the swiftness of this particular action, they would just need to elaborate a little bit more and ensure that all killings, including Ames Wali and many of the ones that has happened, politically and non-political ones, that will create the level of confidence the general public will have in the police. And the general public as key stakeholders to the work of law enforcement. It will really go a long way once they begin to trust the police and they are willing to volunteer information to the police. But I think the police have a responsibility to ensure that crime prevention becomes number one priority on agenda. And with national resources at their disposal, we will urge them to do more. And where they did well, we will commend them just like they have done today, and we are committed them going forward. Definitely, the police has shown some renewed energy with the coming in of uh, uh, IGP Dampari, but definitely it doesn't re erase the fact that people have lost a lot of confidence uh, in the police. How can the police um, uh, restore that confidence, uh, knowing very well that the police need the public to be able to do their work? Security is a leadership issue. And it's a leadership too. I think they must provide leadership. They must be more proactive. They have to be circumspect. And taking the bull by their horn, addressing issues that border on public safety and national security for national sovereignty. It will go a long way to boost the morale of the young people. Then the community will also begin to trust the police, particularly more who are at the forefront of law enforcement in this country. One of the things they must also do is to collaborate more with other security agencies, particularly the BNI, where they will have the intelligence they need when it comes to crime prevention, so they could deploy the right people to the right places at the right time, doing the right thing. 
in that way the police will have an edge when it comes to the general public and law enforcement and when it comes to public safety and total security in this country one of the things criminals look out for once the police become uh, evasive and they have become defensive then the criminals begin to dominate the general public or the public space but once they see the police becoming offensive and the police becoming tactical acting with intelligence then you will see the police will be winning the war i'm only urging on the police to do what is right and to take the bull by the horn and when people breach the law let them be dealt with as quickly as possible and that will go a long way to build the confidence and the integrity issues they have suffered over the years Richard Kumado, I'm grateful for your time. He's a security analyst and he's been giving some ideas as to how police can handle this kind of impunity in the community. Let's jump on to COVID because it's been nearly two years since the outbreak of COVID-19. From Chinese central city Wuhan, the virus has spread to all parts of the world with Ghana recording its first case in March to, uh, 2020. So far, 154,000 people have been infected in Ghana with a death toll of 1,350. It has had devastating impact on the economy with budgets put under extreme strain. There have been four waves during this period with the latest now flattening. So what is the future of this pandemic? Will it end at some time? Remember, there have been deadlier pandemics which came to an end. Talk about the smallpox pandemic which killed more than 300 million, measles which killed 200 million, Spanish flu, with 100 million deaths, Black Death, which killed 75 million, Plague of Justinian, HIV AIDS, the third pandemic, typhoid, cholera, and Hong Kong flu. COVID-19 has so far killed 5.5 million people around the world, far less than the others have done. So how do we approach this pandemic to restore some order in our economic society and the world at large. Today, we've put together experts to help us look ahead of COVID-free future for the country. My guest for this conversation, Dr. Michael Ouso, is virologist at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research, KCCR, and a lecturer at the KNUST. Dr. Thomas Anaba is executive director at the Africa Center for Health Policy Research and analysis. He has also joined us. And Dr. Kwame Amponsachiano, who is manager, expanded program on immunization at the Ghana Health Service. I'm grateful for your time, gentlemen. I'll start with our current situation as a country. Dr. Chiano, where are we now? All right, so uh, I'm told Dr. Chiano is not in yet, but definitely Dr. Michael Ouso has been working in the labs. He knows what's going on. Where are we now, uh, Dr. Michael Ouso? Uh, good afternoon to you, um, Aisha, and good afternoon to um, all viewers. So, talking about where we are now, uh, you know we have been through uh, what we call the fourth wave. And currently, if you have looked at the numbers, uh, we seem to have passed, passed our peak points and we are beginning to record a reduction in the number of new cases and consequently a reduction in the number of active case counts. Um, across the regions, in Ashanti region currently, the number of new cases that we record almost every day has reduced. Uh, currently, we are doing something around 20 to 30 per 100 tests from the community. And that's at this morning is 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 going is going um, very very um, low. Among travelers, for instance, the rate is about one to five percent. Uh, I mean, for all the travelers that come to our um, our, our facility. So, um, as we speak now, the numbers looks good, and it looks as if uh, we are getting through this. Uh, I mean, um, through this wave, and things may normalize, and the, the numbers will eventually get to zero, uh, and things things will be fine. From what we see about the trend of the virus. Well, um, some few weeks ago, we were here lamenting over the upsurge of Omicron uh, infections. Um, has it reduced, or we still have the Omicron dominating infections? Well, in terms of, I mean, the, the variants, of course, for, for all positive cases that, that we are seeing, about 90% of, of these positives are I mean, due to Omicron. Uh, and that is what is known. But as 
as we know about the virus, I mean, if it runs through the population, it reaches a saturation point uh, where many people become immune, many more already infected. And when it reaches that point, it, it, it doesn't go up again, and the number of infections and little infections automatically begin to reduce. So yes, it is still Omicron, but then because it has reached its peak point uh, and almost uh, the virus, we say, satisfied with what it's supposed to do, um, we, we, are, we are fine. And from now going, we wouldn't see surges like we used to see. So what we have to be looking out for is perhaps another variant. So if a new variant comes in that is much stronger than Omicron, then we will start the cycle again. But for now, it's still Omicron, but then it, it has reached a point where it cannot cause active infections like we used to, we used to see uh, some uh, couple of... Uh, already we are hearing of a new variant in France, uh, the IHU or IHU variant. Um, how deadly is this variant and it, whether it's not even here already? Yes, um, I mean, I've looked at this variant. It also has quite a number of mutations, uh, a bit similar to Omicron. But then this is a variant under monitoring. It hasn't yet assumed the status of a variant of concern. And you know that variant of concern have about five classifications. One of them is that it must have high level of transmissibility. And two is that it should be able to cause severe disease and death. And it should be able to affect um, the current therapies which are in place. It should have impact on the preventive measures in terms of the non-pharmacological interventions. And they should be able to affect the diagnostic capacity I and mean, in terms of ability to detect them in the lab. So this variant from France has not fully fulfilled these criteria. And therefore, WHO has not come out to declare that one as a variant of concern. So now it is a threat, but it doesn't look like it will have the capacity like we have seen for Omicron, for Delta, for Alpha, and then for Beta. So, so it's good news that um, our uh, figures are declining. And uh, just as uh, Dr. Michael Ouso rightly said, um, we, 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 it looks like we've overcome the fourth wave. Dr. Anaba, what could be accounting for the success once again? Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas Anaba, are you on? Kindly unmute for me, Dr. Anaba. All right, so uh, we need to check Dr. Anaba's line and then see what the problem is. Then. But I can still put that question to you, uh, Dr. Michael Ouzo. What could be, um, you know, what, what is accounting for this uh, success that we've chalked uh, recently? Factors, some of which are unexplained. Um, one of them could be due to population uh, genetics uh, or immunity that is unexplained as we speak within, especially the African populations, that we cannot tell why some of these variants uh, cannot run through the population and cause disease as much as we see from a lot of the Western world. So this is something that those studying immunology will have to help us to know exactly why uh, we, we are a bit robust when it comes to dealing with spirals of this nature. The other thing could be some level of vaccination might have helped to reduce the impacts of, of these variants, although we still have not reached the target, but then it's still substantial enough. The other is because of the nature of the virus. So this virus called Omicron um, lacks certain, certain characteristics, I mean, compared to the Delta. So... It is able to cause disease, but then it's quite mild and it cannot enter through the lung cells to cause lung, severe lung disease and infection, which is why we didn't hear much about, um, I mean, dependence on oxygen or, I mean, requirement for, for I mean, um, people who, who need oxygen to, to, to survive. This, this vein did not seem to characterize uh, in this current youth we have. So a number of factors has contributed to what we see now. And the good thing is that it seems to be have behaved like the normal common flu that we usually see, what is, what is typical of this. But we have to be careful because the next variant that will emerge, we can't predict. What is why we always advocate that things like vaccines are still important, not because of the current variant, but because of future events that are unpredictable. So it is better to keep our systems more robust and immune. 
to prevent any form of subsequent infection that may occur from wilder and much stronger uh, variants of, of this nature. Mm. Um, as Dr. Anaba back, if you're back, I just want to do an assessment of the country's um, approach to dealing with this situation. Uh, how would you describe it? Well, they, I, I barely hear. I don't. And I think the network is very, very disruptive. I All barely right. hear your question. So we would have to fix the, uh, your line so that you can hear us from the studio. Then we can have a conversation, Dr. Michael Ousu, um We've seen a number of pandemics, and uh, we've seen the kind of death it has caused. You talk about the Spanish flu, the um, uh, what, the uh, smallpox, measles and what have you, you've realized that the number of deaths recorded are even more. The COVID-19 deaths are far less than these deaths. So uh, the question now is, where are we going from here? Uh, does it mean that we would have to record more deaths before we can now come back and declare the pandemic over? Or is it over until it's over? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's quite uh, interesting. Um, if you have studied the pandemics that we've had before, especially pandemics due to viruses, it was because, I mean, the world was not more, I mean, wasn't much prepared as at those times compared to now. Technologically, we were not that advanced. We could not study, we could not understand, we could not address some of these situations. So the smallpox events that we spoke about, uh, polio and many other pandemics, we didn't know what we were dealing with, so it had to kill several people before we finally got to know what we, what we were dealing with. Look at Ebola as an example. It killed many people before we were able to discover the virus. But because of our capacity to sequence uh, these viruses, we are able to come up with, with, with laboratory assays that can detect, design vaccines, design drug therapy. So this puts us much ahead some way. Uh, ahead of this pathogen, what is what is why we are seeing low deaths now compared to before, and we seem to have much capacity to detect early, uh, to put in policies to study the behavior of the virus in, in a better way than before. So, talking about when this will end, uh, personally, I don't think that this virus behavior is going to end now. But perhaps we will not we will not talk about pandemics, but we will be talking about seasonal. Uh, infections, whether it's due to respiratory organisms, like we see in many countries. So it got to a point where, I mean, if almost every every season, especially during the cold and hamatan season, if you have flu and you cough, 10% of that could be due to SARS-CoV-2, and the rest could be due to other viruses. So, so but this may not necessarily cause death, but you may have mild illness and, and some flu cold. So, and I'm quite confident this will go alongside with the, with the vaccine coverage. So, if many countries are able to cover the vaccines and we have huge populations vaccinated, then naturally we are going to be more immune and therefore weaken the effect and the impact of the virus. This is what the world is preparing for us. And until we have full coverage, it will be difficult to say the pandemic is over. But once you have full coverage, then you can say that indeed most of the populations are immune, and no matter how the virus mutates, it cannot go through a wave and even cause pandemics uh, like we have seen before. We didn't know this virus, but now we know the virus. And therefore, once we are a bit protected, I think, I think we, we can do it. So we need to advocate rather in the vaccine direction and get more people to take the vaccine and get a threshold. Uh, at which point, we can consider this as a normal flu and we didn't, we didn't want to spend or uh, invest much into addressing it as a pandemic, uh, get back to a normal life. Um, thankfully, Dr. Thomas Anaba has joined us again. Hopefully, the line gets better right now. Uh, Dr. Anaba, I'm asking us to do an assessment. First, let's start with our vaccination drive as a country and just suppose it with other African countries. How are we faring? I think we are doing well. We are not bad at all. We have a lot of vaccines. Uh, more than many other African countries, uh, thanks to the benevolence of all those who love it and are donating to us. And I think the government is also pushing hard to get uh, the public uh, vaccinated, to get everybody vaccinated. Uh, the only sad thing is that we, we are not seeing uh, the results of the vaccine as we expected. 
and then uh, people are still contracting the COVID-19, despite the fact they are having four doses and, and booster doses, booster doses upon booster doses getting the infection. That is not to say that the vaccine is not, is not that good, but it has not met the expectation of many, including myself, that I, we thought that getting the vaccine, no one again will be contracting the virus, but it turned out not to be so. As we speak, we don't have a clear, direct indication of how frequent everybody should be vaccinated or to get it. Is it going to be a seasonal vaccination or is it going to be a one-time a, 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 a shot of doses and after that you'll yeah, be taking boosters once in a while? As of now, we don't know. Uh, but for Ghana, let me say, we are not doing that at all when it comes to the vaccination of our population. Now, um, aside our vaccination drive, of course, we had um, um, a, a target of 20 million Ghanaians who we wanted to vaccinate. Uh, how would you say uh, we've performed with this target? Are we anywhere close to the 20 million? Thanks, Marie, and we hope that we we'll get close. I think that education needs to go, we need to educate people more. But I think people have the hesitance to read because of the issues that arise from the vaccination. So many, so much of literature advanced in the system uh, to convince people that the vaccine is not working. So much literature advanced in the, in the system that shows that people are getting side effects uh, from the vaccine. But uh, in general, uh, what WHO can say and we can say is that it has tried its best to minimize the severity of the presentation of, uh, of the of the vaccine. Dr. Anaba. Hello? Yes, you're still on uh, on, on the pulse. Yeah, so I'm saying that we, 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 we have to get people to be better, get, get education deep into the public to understand the importance uh, of the vaccine. Once majority of us vaccinate and we get a herd immunity and we get a critical number of vaccines, vaccinated then it's better. But I think that we should emphasize much on those who are comorbidity because literature shows that we are the ones who are really suffering when they get the COVID-19. We have to get those people from being to do away with the perceptions they have despite the negative uh, news that we receive about the vaccine. And some of them are true, uh, but we still have to convince people enough. What, what some of us do not, do not want to push to is to uh, force people mandatorily to, to take the vaccine because we think that everybody has this right uh, to either take the vaccine or not, and uh, everybody needs a literature. And then uh, once you take it, you can still get it, and once you don't take it, you can still get it. It doesn't make a difference. So uh, I think that we should rather persuade people to take the vaccine uh, so that it will be faster than putting a blank law to force people to take the vaccine. Now, there's been a number of interventions like, uh, you know, abiding by the protocols, the vaccination drive. I mean, the last few months has been very uh, active. Uh, we've been very positive with it. And just like you indicated, we've made a lot of headway with that. But the question remains, will we ever see an end to this pandemic? Will we? Are we going to ever see an end to this pandemic? Oh, uh, this pandemic. To be, to be frank, the way the virus is mutating every day and night, every now and then a new variant has come, every now and then a new variant has come, no one at this moment will think that to exit this crisis. We may have an improved situation uh, because of several factors enumerated by the previous uh, uh, person you interviewed, and I think that is one of the things that will help us reduce the, 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 the consequences of the, of the current uh, pandemic. Uh, science has evolved so fast. We now know treatment for it. Uh, hospitals have been uh, properly resourced, especially in the developed countries. Uh, people are taking uh, 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 tests every now and then to see whether they have it. All these things is what is going to help minimize it. But to say that we have an end to it now, I beg to differ. I don't think we will. We will have it for long. And we should, what we should be doing is having our hospitals with the needed uh, uh, diagnostic materials for every. A hospital in this country with enough treatment for it that we know vitamin C and then the rest are very good for it, aspirin and steroids. We get them stuck in our in our facilities to make sure that every hospital can be able to test anybody for COVID-19 and treat them as and when they are positive. And uh, we should have guidelines 
on how people should be treated at home and all that uh, for COVID-19. But to, to say that we'll be out of the woods uh, now is not possible because uh, just as we said, there is a new variant which is uh, uh, not yet of concern, but we have to watch it very carefully. We don't know what it will do. And we don't know whether after that variant, another one will come or, or not. So we have to keep watching uh, and, and be alert that anything can happen, that we are not out yet. Made significant gains. I mean, listening to the two of you, uh, and of course, listening to the uh, Ghana Health Service uh, Director, Kuma Bwaje, who spoke earlier at a press briefing, announcing new measures to help uh, manage our situation. But if we have to leave with this, uh, because right now nobody knows when this will end, what should we be doing as individuals? What should we be doing at the government level? Dr. Michael Ousu. Yes, so at the government level, uh, we, need, we need to intensify our surveillance um, in different ways. One is uh, a public health surveillance where we continue to monitor clusters of infection, monitor events that may occur at any point in time, even, even when we are not having active cases, so that immediately you hear of clusters of infections, you can easily quickly move in and then address it. I mean, the next part also is to look at how to intensify our sequencing capacity. And the sequencing is what enables us to know whether we are having emerging variants of concern or not. So you have to put in mechanism to monitor and to ensure that uh, you are able to keep track of this so that it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't escape detection and doesn't cause some unwarranted deaths even before you begin to go. And also when it comes to some of these non pharmacological interventions in terms of making water available, ensure people wash their hands and to become more part of our lives, ensuring that mask wearing is still enforced. Until the outbreak or the pandemic is declared over, you still cannot hold, hold back the mask. This still has to be done. And ensuring that, of course, the vaccination is available as much as we can, said so that I mean, many people will have the opportunity to vaccinate themselves so that we can keep our bodies at certain threshold and then possibly uh, prevent any form of wave uh, that may come in. So I think if we are able to do uh, some of these, it will help us to be able to put uh, this, this viruses under control uh, so it doesn't go out of hand and become a problem that uh, will affect us economically and also affect our livelihood as people. Mm. There, there's been conversations about boosters for those of us who are fully vaccinated. I mean, is this conversation very critical as we speak, if indeed we have to survive this uh, COVID-19? Of course. I mean, it's a conversation that uh, we cannot do without. Uh, already, you, have, you know that a viral like Omicron uh, is able to break through uh, vaccines, even booster doses, two or three doses, they still can break through. So the question of about boosters is something that we should expect, not just taking it once and for all, but we should see this as, as, as something that will be happening annually. Every year, there will likely be booster doses for us to take to keep our immunity at a certain threshold so that we can deal with any emerging mutations that will come in. Just like we know for the influenza A in the US, for instance, it's still not over, but then every year they expand the vaccine coverage to deal with emerging strains of the virus so that we'll keep the bodies uh, I mean, a bit protected from, from, from this. So I, I, I expect and I think that it is likely we'll be having annual boosters until the point where we feel that the virus is, is extinct from the system. But so far as I know, it may not get extinct. It is we, the humans, that will have to boost our bodies to, to deal with it. So we should expect this at least every year. We should begin to discuss this and to see how best we can implement this fully mm. uh, for, for the entire country. Well, what happened to natural immunity? I mean, are we far from that? Well, you know that natural immunity is in max, but it has some level of duration. I mean, we know if you are infected and you have natural immunity, at least from three to six months, the immune level begins to wane down. So it's, it's not long lasting. And because it's not long lasting, you cannot depend on it, which is why people can be reinfected even if they don't take a vaccine. 
So before vaccines came in, people had about two or three infections. Uh, and this is because at a certain point in time, your antibody level goes down and you are reinfected, you are reboosted, and then it goes down. So, so we are trying to find an artificial way of dealing with this. What is where people are looking at boosters and boosters and boosters. So natural immunity can help, but then the cause is not long lasting. You cannot depend on it to protect the population for a long period of time unless you look at vaccines as an alternative means of having what we call a, like an artificial immunity, where there's some way somehow better than a natural uh, immunity. Mm. Dr. Anna, but what cue can we take from other countries uh, so we can better manage our situation? I think uh, we are definitely following uh, all what other countries are doing. I don't see what, again, we can take from other countries. What we need is to discipline ourselves and abide by the protocols, uh, get government to make sure all our facilities, as I said from the beginning, are stocked with diagnostic materials uh, to make diagnosis very quick and also stocked with the needed medications to treat people. Once we follow the general protocols and uh, hygiene, social distancing, uh, uh, avoiding crowds, if it is unnecessary for you to go and the rest, we will minimize the spread. And then by that way, we will also get uh, our facilities less congested with COVID-19 uh, cases. I think that is what we need to do. There's nothing new we can pick from any other country. We've even passed uh, uh, and we even that everybody should get the mandate really. What again do we want again? I think uh, we are doing all what every country is currently doing. So let's just continue with that. But everybody should collaborate and let's do it. And let's plan to know that this is going to be the rest for long. So all what we, our measures we are going to put in place, all our plans we have for future, to only factor in COVID-19 uh, uh, as, as one of the, the problems we are going to be resolving until we get a final solution to it. Hopefully there will be any. I'm grateful for your time, gentlemen. Dr. Thomas Anaba is Executive Director, ACHPRA, and uh, uh, Dr. Michael Owusu, he is a virologist with KCCR and a lecturer at KNUSC. I'm extremely grateful that we were able to make it. Now, I'll take a break on the pulse. Remember, you can also join by all our social media handles. It's on Joy News on TV. You can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. We'll be back with more. Welcome back to The Pulse. Uh, now, 17 residents in the Ga'is municipality have been issued sermons for failing to clean their immediate environs. The chief executive officer of the Ga'is municipality, Elizabeth Kakiman, leading a group of sanitation officers inspected homes and shops around Abukobi Township. The inspection, a pilot of Operation Clean Your Frontage initiative, was launched by President Ekofoado in October 2021. There's more in the following report. Inspection started at the Abokobi Township where the chief executive of the Ka East Municipality, Elizabeth Kakiman, and a team of environmental health inspectors checked the immediate environs of some shops in the Abokobi Township. Addressing the media after the exercise, the municipal chief executive of the area warned that all offenders will be punished. We as an assembly, we are also launching it in the municipality just to create the awareness and education for the community uh, so that they will be wary of their actions concerning sanitation. Uh -huh. So we are here today, we launched it at the municipality level, and we are doing the piloting. Uh -huh. And then we have our summons here, people who are defaulters are being served to come to the assembly report, and then the subsequent actions will be taken. The punishment, some is uh, either you'll be fined, and then others you'll be jailed, or both. Uh -huh. For three months, you'll be jailed for three months, or you'll be fined an amount of money. That one depending on the... At the end of the exercise, 17 offenders were cautioned. The MCE gave an assurance that the Assembly will fully implement the policy in February this year. Uh, so we have prepared ourselves. We have three transfer stations. The trucks are also ready, plus the additional one that was given to us by 
the regional minister through Zoom line and the tools. Yes, sir. So we are we are ever ready to to kickstart with the operation clean your frontage and make sure the bylaws will take effect. Anybody who a defaulter will be held responsible. Seventeen. Yes, seventeen. The policy was passed in 2021 by all the assemblies in the Greater. And I am Aisha Ibrahim in the studio here in Kokumlimli. The Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana has said notice that the strike action announced by the association will not be called off until all demands have been met. The association has been going around patching their members ahead of the commence commencement of the strike tomorrow. Central Regional Secretary of the Association, Al Haji Apam Noho, has been addressing a news conference. We refer to the circular issue by the National Executive Council of the Civil and Local Government Staff Association, Ghana, dated Monday, January 17, 2022, with reference number GA3, Volume 2, and the earlier declaration of intent on Wednesday, December 22, 2021, to embark on a nationwide strike from Thursday, January 2022. At this regional executive council meeting held on Tuesday, that is today, January 18, 2022, at the Pimpamse Hotel and Conference Center, Cape Coast, the regional executive council discussed the worsening condition of service of members of the association and the failure of the employer in addressing the plight of members. The Central Regional Chapter of the Association, made up of all the 22 Metropolitan, Municipal, and District Assemblies, and the focal persons from the departments and the Regional Coordinating Council cannot be strike breakers, and do hereby on, t on this Tuesday, January 18, 2022, unanimously endorse and validate the decision of the National Executive Council NEC of the Association to do hereby declare our absolute and unbendable willingness to embark on the nationwide strike action beginning Thursday, 20th January 2022. In as much as we do have an unconditional confidence in our national leadership, we wish to caution that the overly patient nature of our members should not be taken for granted and therefore charges the National Executive Council to be resolute and resilient in championing the fight for better conditions of service. The regional executive council further resolves that the strike action when commenced shall not be called off until the demands have been met. Members are urged to be steadfast and not to kotu to any form of persuasion or threat from anyone or authority to report to work. Long live Ghana, long live worker solidarity, Long live closer. To boy! To boy! Papa will just say that yes, we know you are on transfer, but let's think there's nothing we can do than to make sure that we have to do some actions, you know, council members. We don't know what will happen. And they will put it on the various platforms. And they will grab the press and then the participation. All right, so we'll take comments from members. Mm. Give it to me. That, that one is, 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 is a straightforward. You monitor your departments, but they recognize at one place. They are not decentralized. So we expect you to move to where all right, so.
A development enthusiast has devoted a portion of his savings working in the diaspora to help develop his home community, Santroko Febrenua, in the Guan district of the Oti region. According to Simon Amewuga, he saved $40 daily for 22 years during his stay in the United States of America working in the hospitality industry. He since began initiating development projects starting with the construction of a concrete road. There's more in this report. Santro Kofi Brenua is the community that welcomes you to the Oti region driving through Hohwe. Indigenous of this underdeveloped community are mostly peasant farmers. They are plagued with bad access roads, a lack of potable water and a befitting health center. This gave reason to Simon Amawuga's decision to commit a portion of his earnings to the development of the community. He has since constructed a concrete access route to connect the Bachana suburb of the community to the Hohwe Jasekine Highway. So when I got to America, I decided to save towards purposely for this project. But for the first few years, I was not able to, I mean, to save. So after some five years, I came back to my senses and start making up the money. Like I was trying to save like one dollar a day. But after the first five years, I missed a target. So I, I had to make it up to $40 a day. So in 22 years, I was able to save money about $368,000. And then I, I was sure I can be able to uh, fulfill my, my, my promise. Um, I really want a legacy for the village. Building a house for myself is not a good thing to me. It's just for me alone. But whatever I can do to help the community, that's the most important to me. That was one of the most uh, important reasons why I did this. Residents are currently experiencing a lack of access to potable water as the only water system serving the community has broken down. I'm thinking of the, the school, the school buildings, the classroom, and most of all is the water. I want to get the water to the village. By uh, 2022, December, I should be able to build something that will sustain, I mean, solve the, the community water problem once and for all. That's my next project. The assembly member for Santroko Fibrenua electoral area, Nana Opoku Minta, lauded the efforts of Mr. Meuga. At least this road was first constructed up to the school compound by the elder brother, known as uh, Mejibe Ameu. So this road later became a very deplorable road that no car can even pass on. So it was a very welcoming news to the community to hear that he was coming to construct it. And lo, lo and behold, he came down, sent people to come and construct the road. And they started it, and he has done it. And it's not something the community is very proud of. The traditional authorities acknowledged Mr. Meuga's commitment to enhance the livelihoods of residents and honored him. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Santrukofi, Brenya. The Fakumono Complex 2 Primary has converted its library and computer into classrooms for KG1 and 2 pupils. The school lost its KG department to fire during the COVID-19 lockdown period. The new space is very congested as a result of the swelling numbers brought on by new enrollment as school reopens. Joy News as Mausi Numo visited the school and has come through with this report. There are about 60 people in the newly converted classroom for KG peoples. Both library and computer lab space put together should originally accommodate just one class. That is currently not so because of the fire incident. The bent classroom is yet to be rehabilitated. Headmistress of the school and the Rita Newton gave details account of the incident to join news. It's supposed to be our KG, our KG1 and KG2 building. During the lockdown, we the place got bent yeah we had electrical issue and then during the lockdown it got bent we are managing with our library for the time being 
Yeah, that is where we are hosting the KG2. And then our ICT labs, we are using it for the KG1. So that is where we are, only that the place is congested. She's therefore appealing to government and corporate organizations to come to their aid. Though the municipal, they promised that as soon as possible, they will come and then renovate the whole place for us. We are just hoping anybody out there that can also come to our aid we will be happy. As the new academic year begins, parents are anxious of securing admission for their children. But that is not certain yet, particularly for these enrolling in schools for the first time. School authority, however, say they are expecting more approaches for possible enrollment. Meanwhile, Deputy Education Minister John Intimfojo, who was at the school to welcome the newly enrolled pupils, urged parents to take advantage of the right of enrollment and free education to put their children in school. We are encouraging all stakeholders, particularly parents, to encourage their children. No child must be left behind. We want to ensure that in, as part of efforts to attain the tenets of Sustainable Development Goal 4, we, we have quality and equitable access to quality education for all. And every child, regardless of their disability, regardless of their socioeconomic background, must all have access to quality education. So today we welcome here at Sakumano Complex 1 and 2 and to all the kids that are reporting to school in all the system regions of this country, we welcome you and we assure you that a bright and solid education system awaits you and that as you progress through, you will be the future leaders, you will be the future teachers, future lawyers, the future men and women who are going to contribute strongly and significantly to nation building. The future of this country lies in the hands of the ones that we are welcoming to school today. We on our part as government, as Ministry of Education, we will do all that we can to ensure that we attain some of the highest standards the world has seen in education. We will ensure that we resort to education as a, a credible strategy for rapid social economic transformation. Greater Accra Regional Director of Education, Monica Ankara, also encouraged teachers to discharge their duties in spite of challenges saddling their Air Force. To give up their best. In fact, they have to give back to society what society has done for them to nurture, help, and assist and appreciate whatever government is doing. Their children are our own. They also have their children in school, so they have to work hard to make sure that they give them the best education that they could so that they become responsible citizens in the near future. Yeah, Rome was not built in one day, so definitely there will be challenges. But despite the numerous challenges, they should give up and then continue to nurture those young ones so that the good Lord will bless them all. Maosi Numos report for Joy News. Session packages proposed for victims and families of victims of the 2005 state-sponsored massacre of Ghanaians in the Gambia have been rejected. The Gambian authorities under the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission proposed uh, $612,000 US dollars to be paid to victims and their families through their respective governments by the Jame 2 Justice Coalition seeking justice for the 67 Ghanaians and other West African nationals who fell victims to the killing say the amount is woefully inadequate. Oyem Interior of our security desk has more. At least 44 Ghanaians and their counterparts who wanted to use the Gambia as a transit point to enter Europe for greener pastures were allegedly killed by military officers linked to the then Gambian dictator Yaya Jamel. An account by a Ghanaian, Martin Tre, who escaped the attack, led to the investigations, including ones led by ECOWAS and UN teams. A Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission, set up by the Gambian government in its report, indicted ex-military ruler Yaya Jame and 13 others, including military officers for state-sanctioned massacre. The report recommended prosecution of the actors for leading extensive state manufactured cover up campaign. It concludes that Yaya Jame is responsible for the killings and for disappearance and torture of more than 67 West African migrants by giving direct orders to the Jangers to summarily execute them in July 2005. Yaya Jame is also responsible 
for subsequently organizing and coordinating to the state apparatus under his command and control a massive and systematic cover-up campaign in order to exonerate himself from responsibility for these crimes. Pending a government white paper in the Gambia, the commission recommended the payment of a total sum of $612,000 to victims and their families. Coordinator of Jamel to Justice Coalition, William Yakum, told a news conference portions of the commission's recommendations are welcomed, but findings fell short of expectations. From the Jamel to Justice campaign, campaign uh, first of all, uh, we thank the TRC for not only validating uh, some of our own findings, but also having the courage to uh, issue this report, which found uh, Yaya Jame and 13 others criminally liable. Uh, we accept these findings uh, with regard to their accountability. Uh, we also uh, uh, grateful for the other uh, consequential recommendations that have been made. We, however, are uh, disappointed in the amount. We think that the Gambian government ought to ensure that this amount is, is increased. Speaking on behalf of victims and their families, the sole survivor, Martin Tre, said, only compensation in the region of 15 million US dollars will be accepted. Talking about uh, uh, the compensation is, 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 is not something which is acceptable to the, the families, those here in Ashanti region and those in Bonafo and those in Eastern region and Western region and Accra, they are not acceptable. So we are imagining the government of Gambia to increase the amount, the compensation that, that the families may be well accepted so that uh, the matter will be put to rest. We, we want to see something like $50 million as compensation. The coalition has appealed to the Gambian president, Adam Mabaru, to fast track implementation of the commission's report. From Kumasi, Oimintiria reporting. The mayor of Accra, Elizabeth Saki, has challenged teachers to use innovative means to train their students. The mayor who taught some schools as part of my first day at school initiative with the Accra Metro Director of Education, Stephen Abamfo, also donated items to some of the schools. Among the schools taught uh, by the headmaster of the Nanka Bruce Basic School in Koligono, uh, Ben Bella Atipo, expressed his appreciation and hope the initiative will continue. I'm very grateful to the mayor for her show of magnanimity. It's very encouraging, and we know that the children and even the staff appreciate it so much. In, in fact, we have been telling the kids that they can be what they want to be, as uh, the, uh, they, they said in their slogan. And this is so encouraging that I know that these children will also push to become uh, some uh, big people in future. At the end of the exercise, six basic schools were taught with 482 students enrolled on the first day of school. I want to challenge the teachers that, as they have promised, they, want, they made me understand that they will ensure that uh, they will teach the children and they will make them the, the understanding to be broadened and understand whatever is going on around them. I'm so grateful to them for saying so, and I know they will surely do it. I also want to encourage the parents, please, in all humility, encourage your child to be at school. Encourage your child to do her, his or her homework. Encourage your child to be reading frequently. Encourage the child to do everything that needed to be done in that at the end of it, it will benefit her and that will give her that, make her more courageous so that all aspects of life, when he stands for any competition, she can go forth and succeed. So this and many other things, I think I will want them to do, and though they will be caretakers of their children, providing all their needs, yet they will also be responsible for their education. It seems to it that they really 
are learning and that they will do everything to be successful, to make them, they themselves very proud. It has emerged that before about eight hoodlums could make their way to the studios and other offices of Radio Adans carry out the attack, 65-year-old receptionist Ruby Ate was ready to face off with them. Last Thursday, about eight men with one wielding a pistol stormed the station, vandalizing its equipment and physically assaulting staff and visitors. The incident has been described as a first of its kind in the over two decades operations as community radio at Adans in the greater Akwa region. So my regional correspondent Kwame Yanka has more. The 65-year-old receptionist feels she could have done more during the incident to save herself and colleagues, but for her age. In a multicolored African print scarf and face mask, Ruby Ate takes a seat. One would be far from right if he or she judged her by her appearance. She harbors more than what meets the eye and remains in a pensive mood. She shares in an interview how the heavily built men, with one wielding a pistol, forced their way into the studios and other offices. I was a man standing beside me, push me, hold my hand, strongly push me into my seat. Sit down. I, said, oh. I started shouting, why? Will you beat me? Why? All of a sudden, they surrounded me here, and I was hearing they are, they are knocking the door, the on-air door, forcefully. I said, I wanted to move. The man in front of me said, I shouldn't move. So I was standing. So I heard one of our colleagues who was on there by then shouting, what have I done? What have I done? He was beaten up severely. The night after the attack was equally troubling for Ruby Ate as she could not sleep. I was feeling pains, really. I was feeling pains and still I'm feeling pains because I can't lift up my hands up as I usually do. So police gave me police form to go to hospital. So I went to the hospital and I was asked to come for Ezri. So, uh, in fact, we are not safe because we don't know when they will be coming back or whatever they mean to do, whether they finished, whether they will attack us again, whatever, whatever. For that, I don't know what will happen next. Member of Parliament for the area, Comfort Doyo Kujo, has since appealed for special protection for the staff as part of creating safe environment for journalists in general. She has also promised to help install CCTV cameras to improve security at Radio Ada, as well as assisting the station with cash. The police at the divisional, regional and national levels have taken up the matter and assured the staff of helping them with resources available. The 65-year-old receptionist is praying to God to lead the investigations to the hideouts of those behind the attack. From Ada, this has been Kwame Yankesh report for Joy News. We're live on the Pulse. If you just joined us, you can also join via all our social media handles. It's on Joy News on TV. You can tweet at us with the hashtag The Pulse. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. We'll take a break. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest from the world of sports. And as I wrap up the polls this afternoon, many thanks for watching. I've indeed enjoyed my almost two hours stay with you. Up next is Let's Talk Showbiz. But also remember, we'll be crossing over to the Finance Ministry because the Minister of Finance, Ken Oferiata, will be addressing the press uh, this afternoon. We'll be crossing over as and when we get that uh, feed. But right now, do enjoy the rest of our program.